you know, a friend of mine said, hey, Timothy, I can teach you how to fill this building by the end of the summer. And he said, but guess what? <clears throat> it wouldn't be spiritual growth. And he says, if you're going to grow the church spiritually, you're going to do it one way, and that's through loving people. And so we have to notice a distinction. And I'm not just trying to make excuses for us being small, but I'm saying there, there, we need to realize there's a difference between growing spiritually and growing merely mechanically through technique. What I might say is merely entertainment or something. Um, and we've seen this happen. Uh, we heard a story recently. A church blew up using technique. And what happened? Satan's ease, able to easily come in there and sift it like wheat. Now, I'm not saying that every big church is merely big church through technique. Certainly not. God is powerful, is he not? But I'm saying what our dependency needs to be on, both now and in the future, is on the Holy Spirit to transform the lives, the hearts of us, and then transform the hearts and lives of people in our community. To grow spiritually. To grow spiritually. And of course, that's, that's starting with us, right? It's starting with us. People need to see the light in us, as we saw in Ephesians and Philippians. Now, as we get to this message, I just want to encourage you a little bit, because I... I'm encouraged, and uh, I want you to be encouraged, too, uh, with reference to, to progress. You know, uh, I heard someone say recently, change is inevitable, progress is not, right? And isn't so, so time's going to happen, change is going to take place, but what's not guaranteed is progress as that change takes place. So we want progress, right? And when, when change happens, when time elapses, but no progress happens, that's when despair sets in. That's when discouragement sets in. And so we, it's vital to, hey, Holy Spirit, I need you. I need, you to be, I need to be seeing you doing something in my life. I need, you to be, I need to see you do something in my church and in my family and in my community. I want something. And here we're coming up to this Rosie's Park uh, picnic, and we, it's like we, we get right up there to the finish line, and I don't want us to just get distracted by saying, oh, this is mechanical, it's just some event we do. No, let's be anticipating the Holy Spirit doing something there. Are there people in this room today because of what the Holy Spirit has already done through the Roses Park picnic? Hallelujah. Yes, there are. So uh, is, is the Lord still, uh, is he constrained in any way by anything external to himself? Is, is he constrained by any circumstance? Or is he still powerful today like he was in days gone by? Yes, he is powerful. So, I want you to be encouraged, but we, we were looking last week at, I could uh, reduce the whole message to, to one thing we were looking at, and that, that is the schemes, the schemes of the devil. We, we read in Ephesians 6.11, put on God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm, stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Now, the strategies there is what the King James translates as wiles. You guys use that word in your vocabulary on a regular basis? Watch out for those wiles. So the word there is, is really has the idea of schemes. And I asked you to define what a scheme is. And how did we define it? Schemes are the schemes of the devil. The schemes are tricks. Tricks. Things that look attractive, desirable, and perfectly legitimate. On the front end, but it's a baited and camouflaged trap. And this is what Paul is telling us to, to be on the lookout for. Be on the lookout for schemes, things that look good on the front end, but actually it's a baited and camouflaged trap from the enemy to seduce us. And the only reason why schemes work is because they look attractive. They look like they're beneficial or profitable to us in some way. Otherwise, schemes have no power. If you saw the scheme for what it what really is, if you saw the scheme as, uh, as not being attractive, as a trap, would you be seduced by it? Would you even be tempted by it? So the fact that Paul uses this word, we have to be vigilant, put on the whole armor of God, you know, our, our, put on the belt of truth, so we are able to see things for what they really are. We need to be able to ask the Holy Spirit to show us things in our life for what they really are. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Are you able to see, have spiritual vision to see what's, what, how, how God sees what's going on in your life? Or is it possible that some of us have fallen prey to a scheme and we're actually being seduced by something that's leading us, maybe ever so gently, away from our faith, away from being spiritual people? 
And when we start to fall prey and seduced by schemes, our light starts to dim because we stop looking as much like Jesus, right? Because we're, 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 we're saying, hey, I'm going to find my joy or my satisfaction, my purpose and meaning in something other than the high calling that Jesus has called me to. And when we do that, it's not only us that suffers, it's, it's our loved ones around us that suffer. Sometimes while we're off being seduced by a temptation, uh, we're so caught up in it that we, we fail to see that meanwhile, back at the ranch, our, our family is being destroyed. Our loved ones are being destroyed because we're not being vigilant. So you got to think about it. Are there any things that Satan, um, is, the enemy has brought to you to sit, that is really a scheme that you've been seduced by, you're seen as attractive, and you see there's, there's this... Um, there's this kind of double-mindedness in you where you're seeing, hey, I know what the Lord says, but this, this ain't so bad. You know, I can kind of go this way. I can kind of allow this thing into my life. I can kind of allow this isolation in my life or I can just allow myself to be bitter in this area. Uh, or I can, I can harden my heart towards this person or towards this situation. Those are all schemes. We don't want to let any of those in our life. We want the Lord keep me humble. Help me to be vigilant. And so um, critical. So our, our enemy comes to do one thing, and that is destroy. And what does he want to destroy? He wants to destroy God's created order. He wants to destroy God's creation. He wants to destroy God's design. And if he can, he wants to destroy it so much that it leads to death. It leads to death. I mean, you look at all the things that are happening in our country, things that are, that are uh, wicked by, by God's holiness, holy standards, and what it often is, it's something that's good, that's tweaked a little bit, that's modified a little bit, and it's Satan saying, hey, you can have this, but not by God's design. Let's remove a few essential properties, and you can have this thing, and it's really what it is, is Satan's desire designed to, to, uh, to uh, ruin God's plan. Because you can have the good things that God has promised, but have them in a different way. And we don't want to be seduced by those things. So, Again, um, he comes to destroy. He wants to cause us to despair, to be bitter, to harden our hearts, to remove ourselves from community and go into isolation. Those are schemes of the devil. Those are the schemes of the devil. For men, it might be to have a pity party for yourself, right? To be harsh uh, towards, your, towards your loved ones, towards your family. So when we're tempted to despair, to become bitter, to harden our hearts, to isolate, we need to be mature enough to recognize those temptations for what they really are, attacks. Attacks. Can you get that? I just want to just pause here for a moment. When temptations come, these desires, and I'm just listing a few, it might be different for where you're at right now, to, to allow your heart to become bitter, to go into isolation, from your gospel community, to harden your heart. I want us to have enough spiritual maturity, having uh, put on the full armor of God, God, so that we see those things for what they really are. And what are they? They're attacks. So for instance, in, in, in my marriage, if, if I'm not being, uh, having spiritual alertness, we're going to talk about that in a moment. If I don't have spiritual alertness, if I'm not... I'm not um, being vigilant, that is to say, I'm not standing firm, having put on the armor of God. I could so quickly transition into thinking that when my wife, say for instance, if she ever did this, if she lashed out at me, I could quickly transition into thinking my wife's the opponent. And I could reciprocate and lash uh, out at her. Or the same thing could be, I could, I could be walking in the flesh, lash out at my wife, and she could take that offensively and lash back at me, and what happens? It escalates. Instead of having the spiritual alertness to back up and say, wait a minute, this is a scheme. This is a distraction. This is trying to, to get me to be diverted from, from putting on the armor of God to treat my wife as an opponent. Is my wife ever going to be my opponent? Or is it possible she's caught in a snare, she's caught in a scheme, and the worst thing for her, the worst thing I can do if I love her, is to follow her into that scheme. Instead of saying, hey, Rebecca, I really believe our marriage is under attack right now. I need, as a spiritual leader, let me just pray for you. And let me follow that up with a hug, because I care about you. I know, you know, you're, having, you're under attack. You know, I'm not going to hold this against you. I'm going to pray for you right now. 
Would that be a better alternative, a better strategy? But how easy is it for us to just like fall prey? And suddenly it's escalating. Next thing you know, there's this, we're not reconciled. There's, there's this division among us. And, you know, we're, we're staying on, uh, both of us are staying on our side of the house, right? And we're not walking together. Does Satan want our marriage to be in, have unity? Or does, what is this, one of his other primary uh, uh, schemes, strategies, is to divide and conquer? You've seen that, right? So knowing, if I say, hey, Satan wants, doesn't like the fact that our marriage brings glory to God, doesn't like the ideas, idea and design of marriage, God's, God's design, he wants to divide and conquer that marriage. Same thing he wants to do in the church. He wants to divide and conquer because we're more vulnerable when we're divided, right? And we talk about the idea of, of when we have unconfessed sin in our lives, what are we given? We've given a foothold to the devil. We read in Ephesians 4. And how do we define foothold? We defined it as we're giving um, real estate over to the enemy in our lives. Saying, enemy, you are able and uh, I give you full permission to occupy this part of my life. This is your real estate. Feel free to camp out here. When we have unconfessed sin in our lives. And so having unconfessed sin, having given that real estate to the enemy, he's divided and conquered so he can conquer now, that really leads us to the next thing that Paul tells us to do in Ephesians 6.18. Uh, and this is where I want to uh, spend some time this morning. So again, seeing attacks for what they really are, having enough maturity to not get offended, take up offenses, but to see those offenses as really attacks where people need us the more. They don't need our attack, they need our support. Ephesians 6.18 Paul goes on, immediately following the put on the spirit, uh, armor of God passage that ended in 17, he comes right away to say, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert, spiritual alertness. Stay alert and be persistent, persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. All believers everywhere. So this, what we're seeing here is some people have thought that the Praying in the Spirit is just another piece of the armor. But really, if we look at, um, look at what's going on, what we find is that praying in the Spirit is really what animates all the rest of the pieces of the armor. Prayer is vital. And he says, notice he says, pray in the Spirit. We'll talk about that in a moment. It's when we have given in to the temptation to become bitter, to harden our hearts, to become irritable, to isolate, that we least like, uh, we feel least likely like, uh, like praying. Isn't that often true? When you've already succumbed to the temptation, uh, my wife will do this to me sometimes. You know, I, I'm, in, I'm in the flesh. I've lost it. I'm, I'm in sin. I'm not treating her correctly. And she'll turn to me or right before bed, right before I'm ready to sleep. We're already in bed. I'm ready to sleep. She'll turn to me and say, hey, can we pray? And how do I answer that? I can't, do I say no? And I'm thinking of every, how can I say no? No, I can't say no, that's just not going to work. And it's like we have this antithesis, like this, uh, hey, when, when, when you most need prayer is when you least feel like praying. Isn't that often the case? When you've already given in to temptation and you're in sin, and hey, my, my wife is being more spiritual than me at this moment, and turns to me and says, hey, we need to pray right now, and they're like, uh-uh. I need to attack you some more, right? I need to show you that you're wrong some more. But is she right? Is my attacking her going to help the situation? Or is it just going to give more real estate over to my enemy? So we have to realize that. And it, doesn't it take some humility at the, in those moments to stop and realize, you know what? I've already yielded to temptation. Let's not give in further. Let's pray. Let's actually pray. And that's what Paul is calling us to do to animate the, the armor of God is to pray on all occasions in the Spirit. So, <clears throat> again, I just want to challenge us again with this. Can we get to the place where instead of being annoyed, no one here gets, ever gets annoyed with anybody else, right? No. We're too spiritual for that. That was at the beginning when we first became Christians. Can we get to the place where instead of being annoyed with each other, 
we recognize that what we need to do is pray for each other. Sound good? Now, notice it says, uh, he's going to say, um, it says the end of verse 18, it says, uh, in your, uh, be persistent in your prayers uh, for all believers everywhere. And what, I, what we can take from that partially, uh, partial, part of what we learn from that is that when we've fallen into temptation and get, fallen uh, victim to a scheme is most often when we need someone else to pray for us. So prayer happens in community. You know, and so again, let's get to the place where instead of being annoyed and taking up offenses from one another, the members of our household and the members of our church, that we direct those temptations to be annoyed or irritated or frustrated or bitter, direct those things in, uh, to God. Now, is God going to be offended himself if you express uh, frustration, express your irritation and annoyance to him? Can he handle that? I would say he's the most appropriate person to direct it to. Can we, hey, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna have to lose it with somebody, can you direct that losing it to, to the Lord? Pour out your heart to him because he actually commands us to do that. He says, cast all your fear or anxiety upon him. Cast it all on him because he cares for you. He can bear the weight. And he can do something about it, which is a good thing. He's powerful. So, again, we, we got to stop back. Instead of like being lightning quick to respond in kind, to reciprocate, to attacks we're going to receive. And don't the attacks that we often say here, don't the attacks from the ones closest to us hurt the most? Right? The ones closest to us, the, the, the loyalty that we need from those loved ones that we've been intimate with, that we are intimate with. That sense of betrayal is painful. And so, there's, again, the, the temptation is to reciprocate. They are being disloyal to me. I'm going to show them. That hurts. So they're, being, they're giving me pain. I'm going to give them, I'll show them what pain feels like, and it escalates. Instead of saying, hey, my loved one, this is where it says, for instance, in a marriage, it says, for better or for worse. This is an opportunity to fulfill that vow. I need to pray for them, not take up an offense so easily. And fall prey to the schemes of the devil. So we have this idea in Ephesians 6.18 of, well, even if it's really started back in uh, Ephesians 6.10 and and 11. And this this idea, I believe, is mentioned four times. The idea of standing firm or resisting, however you would translate it. And part of the way we stand firm and resist is through prayer. And so here comes this idea that we find in multiple books in our New Testament, the idea of watch and pray. Stand fast, stand firm. And so putting on the armor is like my go-to is prayer. My go-to is prayer. And and through that, I'm going to watch and pray. Now, can we think of any examples where um, a, a person, a group of people in our New Testament was called upon to watch and pray and where they, they either succeeded in that or failed at that, and we see the results. So I, I want us to look, just to, 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 by way of illustration, um, Paul is telling us in Ephesians 6 to do exactly what Jesus called the three disciples to do with him the night he was taken into custody in the olive grove there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we want to look at that uh, in Mark, because Mark is, is brief. He always he cuts to the chase. Have you noticed that about Mark? So uh, Mark 14, we'll begin reading in verse 28. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read through this quick passage, and I want you to see how this situation, this scenario, plays out with reference to the topic of watch and pray. Okay? Let's see what the results are, and then we can apply that to our own lives in times where we need to be, which is on every occasion, to, to stand firm, to stand fast, to watch and to pray, to be spiritually alert and vigilant. 
So we'll begin reading in Mark 14, verse 28. But after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter said to him, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter declared emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. Check it out. And all the others, what? Vowed. Is vow a strong word? And all the others vowed the same. So, do we believe Peter? I mean, we know how the story plays out, but Peter sounds pretty emphatic, right? He he's pre, seems pretty adamant. He's going to do this. And the other disciples, of course, they vow the same. They, verse 32, they went to the olive grove, called, uh, olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch. There it is. Keep watch with me. He went on a little further and fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him, pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. See how Jesus is casting his care on him? He's making a request, but in the end, he's yielded. He's yielded to the will of the Father. Verse 37, then he returned, and he found the disciples standing fast, vigilant, spiritually alert, right? Just like he asked them to, because they just made a vow. Is that what it says? Oh, he found them asleep. <laughs> he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? There's genuine surprise there, right? Are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not, here it is, so that you will not give in to temptation. And isn't that what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 6? For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. What's the antidote to that weak body, strong spirit dilemma? Prayer. Watching. Then Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayer as before. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping. For they couldn't keep their eyes open. And they didn't know what to say. Speechless. When he returned to them the third time, he said, go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. You think Jesus is a little disappointed? You think he's a little pain there, a little bit of a betrayal? I mean, he took his three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, with him. He chose them because, hey, surely they have my back. This is my great hour of suffering that's about to come on me. He's already suffering with distress and despair, knowing that in, in a few hours he will be separated from the Father, something he has never known. He's already to the point of death in that despair. And he brings his three closest disciples. He says to keep watch, and yet they fall asleep. And so he says to them, you know what, go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But immediately as he's saying that, he says, but no. The time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. So in the middle of telling him, hey, you can go to sleep, he says, no, don't go to sleep. Actually, now is the time. There, is, there was no more time before he was to be betrayed and taken into custody. Taken into custody. So what we extract from that was Jesus was prepared through prayer for the hour of temptation. 
When, when Jesus saw temptation coming to, to deviate from the will of the Father and to, to follow after his human nature's will, say that carefully, to, to um, get out of what God the Father called him to do. By the way, that's what characterizes the whole ministry of Jesus. He was still God, but he denied his divine nature and only accessed his divine nature when the Holy Spirit led him to do so. So what he did was, hey, um, he yielded to God's will, and he realized in order to be prepared, he knew what was coming, he knew he faced death of, of a certainty, he said, I need to spend some time in prayer. So he brought his gospel community with him to do that. Now, the disciples, they failed to watch and pray, and so what happened? They were quickly scattered and failed to keep their vow. What happens uh, right after that? Verse 50. So they take him into custody. Um, there was some, you know, the idea of cutting off uh, the servant's ear that Peter felt led to do. <laughs> um, that's not exactly uh, how Jesus wanted them to uh, face um, this trial. But verse 50. As soon as they've taken him into custody, we read, Then all his disciples deserted him and ran away. Then all his disciples deserted him and ran away. That's verse 50. And we had just read in verse 31 that where they'd made a vow, never. And we can say, hey, they failed to watch, they failed to pray, and so they fell in temptation. Because that's just what Jesus had warned them. He said, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Jesus had known they, they'd made this vow. Their spirit was willing, and he knew because they, um, if they didn't watch and pray, they would yield to the temptation to desert him. And they would break their vow, and that's just what we find happening. Now we realize, after Pentecost, after God sends his empowering Holy Spirit, those same men who deserted Jesus stood fast to the death. Isn't God gracious? Because Jesus had already, even before they made that vow, Jesus had already said, that they would, he said, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered as it is written. He already said that in verse 27. So Jesus knew even before they made this vow, the sheep would be scattering because he knew God's sovereign will in, the, in this matter as revealed in, in the word. But still, they failed. They yielded to temptation. Can we, can we just see from that? What we can learn from that episode is that when you fail to watch and pray, you yield to temptation. You're so willing to do the right thing now, but when temptation comes, if you're not prayed up the way Jesus was prayed up, you can so quickly yield, and you look back and say, how did I get here? Didn't I just say with such enthusiasm and force, this is exactly what wasn't going to happen? And when we don't spend our time in the mornings, in our days, to pray as soon as the temptation, because it just comes out of, out of nowhere, we, we so quickly yield to that temptation. You're like, why, how did I get here again? Because we're not walking in the Spirit. We're not prayed up. We're not praying on every occasion. We're not praying on every occasion. So are the disciples a good example for us? Or should I say, are the disciples a good, um, can we learn from them what not to do? What not to do? Can we see how that this is immediately relevant to our passage here in Ephesians 6? Now, the next thing I want you to see this morning is um, what Paul says is praying in the Spirit. Now, could you define for that, that for me in one quick sentence what it means to pray in the Spirit? Because Paul does, he's, he's, he frustrates me sometimes, doesn't he? Does Paul frustrate you when you read? Does the Bible frustrate you sometimes where, you know, the way my brain works, I would like just a, a clear paragraph of definition spelled out just like my systematic theology books do, right? But the scripture doesn't often do that. So Paul says to do something, but it doesn't exactly explain what that even means. He wants us to figure it out based on what he's already said. And he actually, the Holy Spirit wants us to dig into scripture and figure that out. And then we have to actually do Bible study, right? Because then we have to see where else is this mentioned, and as I looked at commentaries on this, I thought, well, one of the places in Scripture I thought about immediately was like a Revelation 1, uh, is it 10 or 11, where it says John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, right? Suddenly heard, and then he has this vision and sees Jesus. So, hey, maybe the commentary will show me what it means to be that, where John was in the Spirit. And as I looked at commentary after commentary, you know what I was getting? One sentence of ambiguity. It's like, thanks a lot, 1,000-page commentary. Useless. 
on this. So I'm going to actually study the Bible myself, which is good. So as I, as I looked at it, um, and I said, what would be most helpful for, for us this morning? And I want, I want to uh, draw attention to two you know, concrete things, at least, that we can take from the idea of praying in the Spirit. And as I, as I begin to share this, what we could say is the opposite of praying in the Spirit. I could define it as vain repetitions. Vain repetitions. You know, that we read about in Matthew 6, verse 7. Or as the uh, NLT translates it, um, people that babble. Can we fall pray? We, no, we, we're, you know, non-denominational evangelicals. We don't do vain repetitions, right? We don't do... Is it possible that we could fall into this? That our prayer, if we're not praying in the Spirit, it was a vain repetition. Okay, so that's, that's how I want to kind of flesh this out. Praying in the Spirit versus vain repetition. Now, here's, here's the first thing I want to share with you as far as praying in the Spirit. Praying with a sense of His presence. Anybody ever ask you to pray spontaneously and automatically go, okay, i got to pray in front of people, Right? But instead, let's say, stop and say, you know what? Um, I'm actually talking to somebody. Who is he? King of kings, Lord of lords. He dwells in a high and lofty place. He is holy. So I'm in the middle of my day. I'm going through things, and I need to pray. Can we just stop in, and, and acknowledge as, uh, his presence, what it is, and step into his presence of all that he is? And you say, how would I do that? Here's one way. Let's, I want to read to you a, a passage I love, and you love it too, as a, just as a reminder of who we're praying to. So I'll read to you quickly a passage from Revelation 1, verse 12 and following. Keep in mind, as I, as I read a description of the exalted, resurrected Jesus, keep in mind, this is who we pray to. When I turn to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He had seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at my feet as if, as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Now, isn't that a beautiful hallelujah? Yes, amen is appropriate. That is the person to whom we pray. Is he powerful? Yes. Is he capable? Yes. Can we stop and acknowledge as we pray that, uh, uh, just remember who it is we pray to? That's the first thing of praying in the Spirit. So we can get away from the idea of vain repetitions, vain babblings. Remember who you're praying to. Matthew 6, 7, we read, when you pray, don't babble on and on as other people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. So we can become guilty of this when we are not praying in the Spirit. And part of the way we uh, keep from uh, falling prey to vain babblings, vain repetitions, is acknowledging having a sense of his presence, who he is that we're praying to. Secondly, is listening. You know, we think of praying as we're speaking, but the second thing I want to call into mind is, do you also in your spirit have a sense that, hey, I want to be listening, I want to be receptive, a sense of yieldedness, because we cast all our anxiety on him, and you're like, and even Jesus prays, you know, if it be your will, remove this cup of suffering from me. But he's, he's waiting in this state of yieldedness for the, for the response of the Spirit to say, you know what? Nevertheless, your will be done. 
Is there a sense, is, does prayer have, the way you pray, the posture that you take in your prayer, spiritually, does it have, are you, um, are you able to be moved? Are you, are you open and yielded to, to changing your mind, having come into the presence of God through prayer? Are you listening as you pray for the Spirit's still small voice to tell you what you need to do? Are you looking for conviction in your prayer? Do you walk away from your prayer humbled, having been in his presence saying, you know what, my little microcosmic will is is nothing compared to the will, the plan, the design that God has for me in the situation. That's what matters. My my little will? what, What I wanted? No. No, he has something far, far more weighty far more important that he wants to accomplish through me and in this. And you walk away and say, you know what? I, I poured out my heart and I believe I know what the, the Spirit wants me to do. And the Lord, if he's calling me to do this, he's going to have my back on it. And I don't know how it's going to play out, but he's going to strengthen me. And you walk away with your faith strengthened, with Humility, with a yieldedness, with a surrendered spirit. So you have a sense of listening. And again, we have to develop an appetite or a love for the the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit. Imagine the certainty you get. Like It may be so counterintuitive to what you were thinking because you stepped into that prayer maybe in the flesh. And as you were praying, the Spirit came on you. And suddenly, your desire, your will has been changed, and you walk away from that with a completely different outlook, and you say, I love conviction. I love conviction, because I was in a bad way. I I was asking um, the Lord, I was demanding of him, actually, for him to remove me from this temptation, when in fact, what he wants to do is strengthen me to go through the temptation, that's what his design was. Wow, what was I thinking? And isn't that just how he works? You get to know God's personality over time, and he wants to do something beautiful in us. So, um, and I, I saw this quote recently, I wanted to share it with you. Um, part of the way we approach God in prayer is shown in this quote. The damned think they are good. The saved know they are wicked. The damned believe the kingdom of God is for those who are worthy of it. The saved know the kingdom of God is for those who realize how unworthy they are. The damned believe eternal life is earned. The saved know it's a gift. The damned seek God's commendation. The saved seek his forgiveness. And when we have that viewpoint of being in the Spirit and looking and realizing um, how God, how gracious He has been to us, how merciful He has been to us, that everything, all of the blessings He has guaranteed us is not based on what we have earned, but because what He accomplished on our behalf and bestows upon us out of the abundance of His grace and mercy. Doesn't that, shouldn't that lead to an appropriate response of humility like, Lord, I will bend to your will? You know, you went through your uh, hour uh, of temptation, your, your cup of suffering, you went through it. Lord, give me the strength to go through mine. So how often, on what occasions are we to pray? Pray in the Spirit. What does it say? Verse 18. All times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere, Paul says. And as I said already, often there's an either or between sinning and praying. Because it's really hard to sin while you're praying. Now, we could probably figure out a way, right? It's really hard, though. So this is uh, either or. When temptation comes, you're either going to eject out of the situation, go your own way, or you're going to be mature enough to see that you need prayer so that you won't yield to the temptation. And that's saying a different way what we've already said. So can you see that? In the hour of temptation, in that moment, when it comes, you're either going to eject and do your own will, or you're going to realize, have enough spiritual maturity to say, realize, this is one of those situations where I need prayer. Let's just stop right now. 
which way do you think is going to go better? And you know, those, those, uh, those, those situations where we're tempted to lose, lose it, lose our, our temper and stuff, oftentimes we're tempted that way because the situation feels like, because it is, outside of our control. And one of the ways our flesh seeks to gain, regain control of the situation so we can bring stability back is to go our own way, to lose our temper, because we have control over that. But how about the yield and the saying, you know what, to realize in spiritual maturity that, hey, this is outside of my control, and I really need some, uh, the Holy Spirit to intervene here. And just to have a yieldedness to say, hey, whatever, um, whatever happens, come hell or high water, I'm just going to be yielded to the Spirit, I'm going to give it over to the Lord, and I don't have to be filled with anxiety because he's got this, because I've, I've brought it to him. I brought it before him in the throne room of grace, and he's got this. He's, he's looking out. And I don't have to take control because I, it's actually self-deception and illusion to think that I could. Some of us have already yielded to temptation in some areas in our hearts, and we need to be sensitive this morning to, the, to those places in our heart where our heart is already growing cold. And as we said before, um, if you're not growing spiritually, you're regressing spiritually. If you're not moving forward, you're moving backward. There's a sense in which the idea of plateauing is, is a myth, is a deception itself. The last thing I have time for is this. Um, real quickly, where is Paul when he writes this? He's in prison. He's in chains. He's in shackles. Not for some crime that, you know, some what we would call legitimate crime, but for ultimately for giving the gospel, for being on mission for Jesus. And what does he pray? He doesn't pray that he should be released from prison, does he? He says, pray for me in verse 19. Pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan and that the good news is for Jews, that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I'm in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador, so pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. He doesn't pray, hey, hey, uh, Ephesians, pray that I can get escape, I can be escaped, uh, escape from this, this prison. Pray that God gets me out of here. You know the way that Peter got out of prison before? Angel showed up, just let him out. Pray for that. He says, no. Pray that I'll have boldness in giving the gospel. So can we get to the place where our prayers are more than asking God to get, a, get us out of the hard situation, but rather our prayers are asking God for the strength to go through the trial in a way that brings him glory and builds spiritual maturity in our lives. Now, Rebecca had... Uh, an awesome opportunity to meet uh, a couple. They were in their 80s. I believe the man was 81 years old. Um, and this was Shannon's grandparents. And uh, she came to me and said, oh, Timothy, I really wish you were here. I just met this couple. Uh, they were amazing people. And uh, she said, uh, they are, um, they hear good things about our church and, and uh, they love to visit, but they're so active in their own church. And, uh, you know, they've, he used to be a pastor. He's retired now um, at 81. He says, they're, they're in such great shape. They're so full, uh, filled with vitality. And uh, as they sh- exchanged stories, what, you, what she learned was is that they'd gone through a lot of trials. One of the major trials they had gone through was, you know, their church had kind of blown up. And uh, the, the next pastor had come in. The young pastor, it was called in to replace the uh, existing pastor, because, you know, he's going to retire himself. And the, the existing pastor, as after he retired, did not like the direction the young pastor was get, going in. And, in. and as a result, you know, there was just, there was a, a coup and a division, and the church shrank back down, and it, it, was, it was a heartbreaker. And what the couple explained was, you know what, the Holy Spirit had called us to continue to follow that young man, and we're still there to this day uh, serving and so they, they expressed all these trials. But Rebecca was like, they are such beautiful people. And what she learned from that is she said, I want to be like that when I'm their, their age. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And that is not going to happen just on its own if we're not praying in the Spirit on every occasion to have enough spiritual insight to say, hey, help me go through the trial because it's going through the trials with the Holy Spirit working in you, sustaining you, 
bringing glory to himself, that you become a beautiful person. It's, it's, that is how it happens. If you want to be a beautiful person, and when I say beauty, someone that looks like God, it's going to take us praying in the spirit, having taken up, put up the armor of God. Are you going through a trial right now? Do you want to see that trial for what it really is? You need spiritual insight to do that. You need prayer to do that. See how God would have you to respond, to go through that. We want to shine like lights. We want to be people. Um, we want people to see Jesus in us. And one of the primary ways this is going to happen is when we go to prayer instead of yielding to temptation. Having a lifetime of yielding to temptation, are we going to really be shining Jesus brightly at the end of our lives? Because you are always becoming the person you will be. We realize you are always becoming the person you will be. And that's why Jesus calls us to repentance. He says, turn from becoming this person, turn, follow after me, and start becoming this person, one that looks like me, one who's, who reflects out the image and likeness of God. So in conclusion, can we learn to watch and pray, to be ever vigilant, to be, have spiritual alertness? Can we, can we cease taking up offenses from each other and learn to pray for each other? And don't some of us need prayer this morning? Take some humility, to, by the way, to, to acknowledge that you need prayer. But how foolish is it to say, no, I'm good. <laughs> I mean, right? But we, our flesh says that, no, I don't want prayer. We, kinda, we, we have a tendency to temptation to harden uh, to our hearts. So I, that's what I want to do this morning. First off, in, conclu- in closing, um, I want our, uh, the men of our leadership team at least to, uh, to pray. You see, here I am calling, calling men to pray. 